the history of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is replete with stalwart men and women who have played prominent roles in extending the ministry of Jesus Christ and the story of the Restoration into the world. Out of the past come the voices of some of these people whose lives and testimonies have meant so much to the Restoration. Because he was frequently called upon to represent the church by radio, President Frederick M. Smith has left us rich heritage in his sermon recordings. Here first is a characteristic pronouncement on his Zionic ideals, given on a Church of the Air broadcast originating on WCAU in Philadelphia on April 4th, 1937. Our church has been working towards the time when an order with religious foundation may and will be established in which the social principles of the Christian religion will have full play. Believing all men because of the functions of fraternity are laborers together with God. We cannot but believe that there is close tie between labor and religion and that religion and those who promote religion should be concerned about laborers and laboring conditions. That religion is a power which promotes universal brotherhood. That religion is for the laboring man as well as the entrepreneur or the husbandman. And that the church should be a power not only in furnishing soul comfort in times of personal distress and untoward conditions of individuals, but even a stronger power in bringing about improvement in conditions under which the more physically onerous tasks of work are born. Our second selection from the recordings of Frederick M. Smith is from an address he recorded to be sent to the youth of the church. Though it was made at least four decades ago, it still sounds timely today. To the youth of the church, I extend cordial greetings and sincerely wish I could be with you to salute you in person. But not being able so to do, I can be with you in a common love for and devotion to the church and be with you in spirit while my voice reaches you by transcription. Some 40 odd years ago as a young ordained man, I began calling upon the youth of the church to prepare themselves for service and urge them to see, seize every opportunity for cultural development and the cultivation of natural endowments and talents and to study ceaselessly against the time when they should be called upon to take upon their shoulders the responsibilities of carrying forward our work and at the same time develop the spirit of such loyal devotion that they would readily, cheerfully, and religiously consecrate themselves and their talents to the church and its work as whole soul stewards in a divine cause. I have defined stewardship to mean an unreserved devotion of time, talents, and possessions to the service of deity through and in the church. I have seen some splendid response to such call, and our core of workers has been replenished as a consequence. But this need still exists to keep our minds on the work of preparation to qualify workers to take the places of those who fall before the swinging scythe of the grim reaper, both locally and generally. The work must go on. Few people there are today who are not conscious of the almost painfully disturbed social and economic, and I may say political conditions prevailing at home and abroad. This feeling of unrest, and I might say uncertainty, reaches into the religious organizations of the people, and laity, as well as ecclesiasts, are markedly depressed. With us it is or ought to be different. From the earliest days of our church organization, we have had before us divinely set goals or objectives in the accomplishment of which we have set our hearts and filled our hands. The divine inspiration and instruction vouchsafed unto us have warned us of times of confusion to come, so that, strange as it may sound to say it, we may find reason for rejoicing because of the troubled times for they bespeak the genuineness of prophecy and point to our unfinished tasks. In the early days of the church, our people and ministers in great unity, developed by earnest zeal to spread the gospel, were intensely active, and they met persecution from without. This enhanced their solidarity and even augmented their zeal. And under the complex impulsion of divine instruction and guidance, ardor which could not be dampened, and the elan of fine unity of purpose and ideal, a fraternity was developed which carried the church forward rapidly. Today there is far less of religious persecution brought to bear upon us 
and we may lack this factor tending to unify us. But the pressure of economic uncertainty, the sense of religious confusion in other churches, not so well directioned by the ideal of economic betterment through churchly fraternity, will, if we properly sense its importance, function toward the promotion of solidarity as did persecution previously. For our conception of Zion and her religious and social ideals still sets us out as a peculiar people. It is a bonding force, lacking in other church organizations. But for the idea of Zion so to function, there must be among us a pervasive understanding of its principles and an all-absorbing zeal for its accomplishment. The fraternity which is so lacking generally today is foundationally necessary for Zionic development. To engender, expand, and then preserve that fraternity is a great task of this church. We may be small in numbers, but we are great in our ideas of making the gospel of Jesus Christ a socially stabilizing force by giving it full expression in the lives of men as church members, citizens, artisans, laborers, businessmen, students, and even those who have leisure time. Zion, with stewardship as the fundamental and pervasive dynamic, will be the means of stabilizing society through fraternity and religion. Youth of the church, what part would you play in the great task? May God inspire your answer. In March 1921, a series of meetings for young people was being held in the Brick Church of Lamoni, the first of the Zion Builders series. Overflow congregations came every night. One young man, Albert McCullough, was at home with a broken leg. Friends reported to him what was taking place at the youth meetings with their stirring singing and inspiring sermons of Albert A. Smith. One day, college friends visited him and, among other things, sang to guitar accompaniment the Hawaiian song, Aloha Oi. This set Albert McCullough's mind to working, and he penned the song we know as Consecration. On the last evening of the series, George Anway became the first person to sing the new song. Later, Brother Anway was asked to record the hymn. Although he was recovering from a severe attack of laryngitis, he consented to make the recording. Though this is not George Anway at his best, it is, so far as we know, the only recording of his voice in existence. Unto God who knows our every weakness With faith we lift our hearts in prayer Asking in humility and meekness For His love, His direction Lord, ex 
Josep, the humble consecration of our lives, our talents to thy cause, till thy word is preached in every nation, and all men have a knowledge of thy laws. In these latter days, with songs of praise, we all must help to spread the gospel story. On September 4, 1945, Albert A. and Clara Smith celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Their children and their independence friends arranged a reception at their home. A tableau was also staged depicting several incidents from their courtship and their happy life together. Not until November 5, 1945, did they get around to making a recording, which has proven to be a priceless keepsake for their children and their friends of the church. Well, my dear, 50 years sounds like a long time, but it isn't very long after all. No, not when two people are happy together, as we have always been. It seemed like a short time, too short. We have a lot to be thankful for, our home and our children, Ronald and Vera, Lynn and Loreen, and little David. Then there's the church and our church work and our many friends. What a lucky thing we found each other more than 50 years ago. I don't think it was just luck. We may call it good luck, but I think the Lord had something to do with it. I used to pray for divine guidance in the matter of getting married. I'm quite sure the Lord had a hand in it. There you were, born away up in Michigan. Then your folks moved to the, the little town of Lamoni. I was born in Nauvoo and grew up in northern Iowa. And neither of us knew much about the other until Mother and I moved to Lamoni and I went to work in the Herald office boundary, and there you were, working with your father in the business manager's office. It was the old story of boy meets girl, goes clear back to Jacob and Rachel, and a long way back of that. Don't forget that the church was the magnet that drew us both to Lamoni on the way to Zion. Yes, and the church gave us the gospel, and the foundation on which to build our home, and the ideals of marriage to make the home lasting for 50 years, and I hope much longer. But speaking of the old Herald office, do you remember how often I had an errand to the front office to bring in books? Yes, in some way, you seemed always to be going about home about the time I did, and we would walk together as far as my home. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. I used to stop at the old Allen Mill on the corner and loiter around until you came along and then I would just happen to join you. But it seemed rather singular, too, that when I was coming from home to work past your house, so often you were just starting to the office. How about that? Well, we had an old clock on the kitchen wall, and I knew just about the time you were due to pass our front gate. You remember that old front gate? I sure do. It was right in front of that old front gate that I proposed to you. And do you remember the old brick church? Yes. It was there we had our first date. You saw me home after church meeting. It was only a block to go, but perhaps our 50 years began to shape up that evening. By the way, I did not even ask if I might see you home. I just took you by the arm and walked you out of the church. I didn't resist. Do you remember the day I hired the old white horse and the buggy from the livery and we drove out west and north of town and stopped in the shady lane and I put the ring on your finger? third finger left? Yes, and do you remember the day we were married? Fifty years ago, September 4th. I remember it all right, but I'm hazy on details. We stood up in the living room of the Cochran home, <coughs> and there was a big dinner, 
And then we got away on the noon train on our honeymoon back to my old hometown of Madison. I can tell you more of the details of the wedding. I have them in my diary. I started to keep a diary several times the first day of January, but I always quit about the first of February. My diary says that Uncle Joseph performed the ceremony, and Aunt Laura Church played the wedding march. I remember that we came down from the upstairs and stood in the southwest corner of the living room under a floral arch that Uncle Charlie Church had arranged. The Lamona paper said, the young people start in life with the brightest prospects and a full complement of love and trust to make an ideal home. I always said that was my lucky day, the day I married my father-in-law's daughter. Fifty years have proved my good judgment. President Israel A. Smith was a man who was convinced God had called him to his role of leadership and that God had acted to bring into being this Church of Jesus Christ in these latter days. In 1952, after six years of prophetic leadership, Brother Israel stood before the General Conference to address the church on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the reorganization. Here in part is his message. A modern scholar by the name of Albert Hubbard, <clears throat> whose writings are more or less familiar to the older members of the present generation, at least, in considering the history of Christianity, and Christian churches said that the primitive Christian is a reactionary of his time, humanity continuing in one direction acquires success, and finally through an overweening pride in its own powers, relaxation enters and self-indulgence takes the place of effort. No religion, he says, is pure except in its inception and in a state of persecution. A religion grown great and rich and powerful becomes sloth and swag. Its piety becomes being performed per funk. Hubbard's uh, contraction of the word perfunctory, I suppose and ceases to be a religion at all. It is merely an institution. <clears throat> a casual examination of some religious movements and some modern churches would almost convince one that Albert Hubbard's conclusions were justified, especially the last one. And then we have another contemporary Peterim Sorokin, who advances the theory, which he says applies to all social organizations, that they, like living organisms, vegetable and animal, have a life cycle, time of inception, growth and development, a period of maturity, and then decay begins to set in followed eventually by death. The historian who notes the origin of the Latter-day Saint movement, its rapid and almost miraculous growth from 1930 to 1844, and what followed its disastrous experience in Missouri and Illinois, and the revolutionary changes which took place as to doctrines in some sections of Latter-day Saintism, could well endorse the Sorokin theory of life cycle and Hubbard's idea that religious movements do not retain their original purity. And from Sorokin, we get a hint of the formula for institutional good health when he very knowingly, I think, added, only an organism with a sound heredity properly satisfying all its vital needs, possessing healthful habits, and living in a wholesome milieu of enjoys good health. The history of the movement begun by Joseph Smith in 1830, however, cannot wholly support either of these theories. 
one applicable to religions only and the other to all or any social institution for the reason that through fortuitous circumstances it became divided within a short period into groups each of which in doctrine or because of other rocks of divergence thereafter maintained an independent existence the reorganized church today is evidence of the fact that the restoration movement did have within it <clears throat> these sound heredity Sir Oakley referred to which enabled the church to survive <clears throat> and that we do possess healthful habits we believe is amply, amply demonstrated this is my thesis <clears throat> the original church was founded on a great truth by men who sought and were given divine guidance. Then followed a period when they were apparently lost until through the patient labors of faithful Latter-day Saints came a church which in doctrine and organization paralleled and was in fact the same organization, the original church. <clears throat> Out of the fires of persecution and apostasy has arisen the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Met here today in general conference, celebrating the end of 100 years of successful, victorious restoration. No Voices of the Past presentation would be complete without the inclusion of the voice of Evan A. Fry. Serving for many years as radio minister for the church, Brother Fry spoke to the minds and hearts of millions of fans and followers. Here is one of his early sermons from the radio series, Hear Ye Him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Our scripture reading has come from the third chapter of Acts, verses 22 through 24. Why should we listen to Jesus? Because if we want to live, even in the narrow, temporal, physical sense, we must listen to the author of all life. Jesus was God's agent or instrument of creation. It was he who made the world and man and all the uncounted universes which surround the one vast universe that we know. He is the source and author and originator of all law, and man must live by law if he is to survive even on this earth. He is designated by God the Father as one worthy to be heard. For on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John marveled at the brightness and glory of his person, and with their own eyes and ears attuned to the spiritual world, heard the voice of God declaring, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Jesus recognized and claimed his right to be a spokesman for God the Father. He said, Whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me only, but him that sent me, even the Father. Again he said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And still again, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And he who honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father who hath sent him. We listen to Jesus because he is the one foretold and designated by Moses and many of the ancient prophets as the one who should be heard in all things. Peter referred to this ancient prophecy of Moses when he addressed the crowd after healing the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple, quoting it thus, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. 
him ye shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. This was the burden of the message of all the early apostles, that in Jesus, and only in Jesus, is to be found the message and the power of salvation, that there is salvation in no other name, that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 2 and 12. When Jesus began to speak the words of God to men, there were many who would not hear. Some were blinded and deafened by their riches and their worldly wealth. Some occupied positions of political or, ecclesi or ecclesiastical preferment, which would have been endangered if they had listened to him. Therefore, they heard him not. After vainly appealing to a crowd of people one day, Jesus told the disciples that they fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. There are none so blind as those who will not see, and none so deaf as those who deliberately refuse to hear. Many other people refused to hear Jesus because he was not the kind of Messiah they expected or the kind of spokesman for God that they had anticipated. People have always refused to hear the word of the Lord when it did not come from expected or socially approved sources. A prophet is always without honor in his own country and among his own kindred. Many refused to hear Jesus because he came from Nazareth, a little country town, instead of from Jerusalem, the big city and ecclesiastical capital of the nation. When he presumed to speak in the name of the Lord, others said, Is not this the carpenter's son? The word of the Lord was not coming from the right place. Are you perhaps failing to hear the words of Christ today because you are sure that they could not come from the man who speaks in Christ's name? Jesus lives. We do not depend alone upon his words spoken long ago and recorded in a book. God still speaks to men through the living Christ. And as God delegated to Christ the authority to speak in his name, so Christ delegated to the apostles authority to speak in the name of Christ. To the apostles Jesus said, He who receiveth you receiveth me, and he who receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. A similar thought is quoted by Luke. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him who sent me. John's Gospel phrases it this way, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He who would hear the words of Christ today, therefore, must be prepared and willing to hear them even when they come from an unexpected source. Jesus said of himself, the shepherd, His sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and a stranger they will not follow, for they know not the voice of strangers. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Men need to know Jesus before they try to hear his voice. A certain spiritual preparation is necessary before men can hear the words of Jesus as they are spoken by his contemporary apostles, prophets, and servants. As Peter, James, and John underwent a partial transfiguration on the mount before they could fully see, hear, and know Jesus, so we need to be changed, transformed, transfigured, born again, before we can truly hear the voice of Christ. We need to be eager, expectant, believing, and receptive. We need to know Jesus as Peter, James, and John knew him on the mount. Then we shall be willing and eager to receive the truth from his apostles, prophets, and servants. Failure to hear them today brings its condemnation, just as failure to hear Jesus and the apostles of old brought condemnation. For every soul that will not hear the words of Christ shall be destroyed from among the people. Only those who prove their willingness to hear by hearing what has already been given can expect to receive more. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear, for whosoever receiveth to him shall be given. And whosoever receiveth not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Jesus is still speaking to men by the mouth of his apostles, prophets, and servants, as well as by the voice of his Spirit. Open your eyes, your mind, your ears, your heart, and hear ye him. Before the development of modern tape recording techniques, the wire recorder was very popular. Messages from a number of the church's leading administrative officers 
went out to thousands of saints all over the world. Among those to use wire recordings to bridge the miles was President Israel A. Smith. Here is his message to the saints in Australia, recorded on wire, June 5, 1952. My greetings to you, brother and sister Swain, and to all the saints in Australia. Through one of the miracles of modern invention, I send you greetings and best wishes. <clears throat> My voice will be reproduced and heard by you in a place far removed from Zion. And while I cannot be with you in person today, I am in spirit. We have been told how fast sound waves travel. We know light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per minute. Radio or electrical impulses go around the world in seconds. Perhaps in the spirit world, there are impulses that travel much faster and much farther than sound or electricity. Else the divine mind could not be extended to the unbelievable distances of the universe now disclosed by our great telescopes. Even with the speed of light, rays emanating from celestial bodies in the days of Christ have not yet traversed the space between them and the orb on which we live. And it is conceivable that the words spoken by our Savior are only now being received, perhaps recorded, in some of the far reaches of creation. Like the waves started by dropping a pebble in the water, spiritual impulses radiating from our innermost souls may be recorded in heaven with greater fidelity than does this electrical gadget into which I am projecting my voice. What I am trying to say is that the things of the spirit are more enduring and of more importance than material things, and since this is true, may not the great creator have provided means for their recording in the courts of glory. While contemplating the wisdom and power of God, I am reminded that in the 85th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the curtain has been lifted just a little, and in the language of a layman, we have been told something about the wonders of creation. Joseph Smith said things in 1830 that our greatest scientists have discovered a hundred years later. What a complexity. Light from the sun everywhere. Electric wave rays, x-rays, infrared rays, cosmic rays occupying the same space, and all traveling on their appointed way without let or hindrance or regard for each other. And through them all, equally without let or hindrance, thought waves, spiritual impulses, which are of greater importance and may be more enduring and far-reaching, never to be sensed by man until he has put off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare calls it, and has taken on immortality. But we are here a part of the cosmos. We have to deal with the things of everyday life, the here and now. The present may present obstacles. We are frightened at times by the perils that surround us. And now I come down to earth, so to speak, and take cognizance of our situation. I am here in Zion trying to administer many affairs and questions reaching the desk of a presiding officer, and you are there at the other end of this wire recorder. Perhaps you have met in Christian fellowships to hear our voices, because all of us have a common objective, our own development, individual and as a group, and to give substantial and spiritual support to the work of the church. We are led to ask, what is the work of the church? One of the most able of church leaders some years ago said the work of the church is social. That was to say, the primary objective had to do with our relationship with each other and society in general. I have not fully agreed with this belief for the reason that it is in the realm of the social that we give expression to our religious beliefs and convictions, our inward grace. 
Robinson Crusoe, alone on an island, might have a theology of his own that involved or included a reverent regard for God, maybe religious beliefs. But he had little outlet for his theory until Friday came along. Thereafter, he had a fellow human being to minister to and by whom he could be strengthened. To love God was the first law. The second was like unto it, to love neighbor as oneself. And we all remember the story of Christ telling his disciples that they had ministered to him when they had ministered unto the least of his brothers. The primary work of the church is to preach Christ, to convert men to his way of life, to accept the gospel, to become identified with his church on earth, and comply with his doctrines. The world is in a chaotic state. The issue before it, the question is, shall the principles of Christ prevail with the peoples of the world, or will it be chaos and anarchy? The cycle of civilizations and their decline seems to be the pattern mankind has made for himself. Is our civilization to perish? As it goes now, some have asked, is it worth saving? Paul Shipman Andrews, dean of the law school of Syracuse University, in an address before the General Assembly of Iowa not long ago, said, and I quote, when 100,000 people died as a result of a split-second blast over Hiroshima in four square miles of that crowded city, we knew that civilization had quite suddenly passed into a new era, an era in which it had acquired the power to commit suicide, to destroy itself overnight. When the tests at Bikini showed the enormously greater power for destruction of atomic bombs exploded underwater, when we learned that radioactive products of the explosion falling upon the ships in that little lagoon could not be cleansed or removed by any known means and might, for all we know, remain in deadly amount for years, for decades, for generations, for centuries, and that for such periods of time, any place on earth which they fell would remain uninhabitable by human beings, one thing at least became crystal clear beyond question or argument or doubt or denial. There must not be another war. And Dr. Shipman continues, we know, too, that any competent chemist can make in a bathtub enough virus of various kinds to destroy the entire population of the United States. Half a dozen or more rocket planes shooting across the United States at a height, say, of 70,000 feet, unobserved and perhaps unheard, could spread this virus in the form of a finely divided fog. We should not know even that we had been attacked until the health statistics started to rise. The epidemics of terrible disease thus spread could be far beyond the power of medical science to control. There are viruses which could be similarly distributed, which destroy crops and grass and animals. This is what the world's greatest scientists are telling us. This, unhappily, is real. Now, Toynbee, greatest of our present historians in his latest book, says that even before the invention of the atomic bomb, he had believed that a series of wars would destroy our civilization. What about the hydrogen bomb, that latest engine of destruction? While I hesitate to dwell further on such a lurid picture, we cannot deny the import of what we see in the world. If there are not enough men of goodwill, whether directly inspired by the doctrines of Christ or gathered from the savants and wise men of the Gentile world, then indeed are we headed for much tribulation. The simplest realistic solution for us as Christians is to Christianize the world. The pattern has been prepared for us, and Christ himself issued the royal 
commission to his disciples when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You and I, all of us, are representatives and disciples of the Master and enjoy the moral and ethical advantage of uh, working within and for an authoritative church, one vested with the right and power to speak in his name. If I should attempt the briefest formula that would point the way for each of us, it would be witness for Christ. That is what the early disciples did. Paul said he must preach Jesus Christ. It is the open sesame that will lead to all hearts. I wish I could once more visit Australia and again meet all of our faithful members, grasp their hands, look into their eyes, fathom their spiritual depths, and give what spiritual and personal ministry I could. Maybe I can sometime. Until then, our communion must be through Christ our Redeemer. My friends, for the Master's sake, you who are so far away, I have the privilege of subscribing myself, your humble servant, Israel A. Smith, President of the Church. Our final memory from the past is offered jointly by Brother Albert A. Smith and the Stone Church Choir under the direction of Paul N. Craig. The message of music and spoken word is directed to the youth of the Church. The substance of the following message was unfolded to me during the night of January 5, 1948, accompanied by a great degree of the good spirit of light and truth and testimony. The restoration movement began quietly, like the slow, soft opening tones of a symphonic orchestra. Perhaps there was a song of a bird the rustle of leaves in the breeze, and certainly the voice of prayer. This was a young man at prayer, scarcely more than a lad, but he represented the spirit of youth, always questioning life and the eternal verities which give meaning to life. His soul had been troubled within him. His mind had been confused by the conflicting counsels of man. But he had read in the Bible a commandment with promise, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and it shall be given him. There was no time limit to the promise. He took it at face value. And so that morning, early in the spring of 1820, he was at prayer in the forest. Soon there shone down upon him a light brighter than the noonday sun. And in the light were two personages, glorious beyond description, one of whom, indicating the other, said, Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. That was the keynote of the Restoration Movement. Hear ye him. 
It is said in the Bible that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That hour, a prophet stood up on earth with a message. The Christ who said, I will build my church, was still speaking and at work. The beginning of the Restoration Movement had not the terrors of Sinai nor the sorrows of Calvary. But this young man and those who accepted his message were to know terrors and sorrows. They were to hear again the voice of Jesus saying, They hated me without a cause. The servant is not above his Lord. When they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. The testimony of the testators was to be sealed with blood. As the Restoration Movement unfolded, there came the experiences of Camorra. The plates of the Book of Mormon were revealed to the prophet by the hands of an angel. They came into his possession and were translated and published together with the testimony of three reputable witnesses addressed to all nations, kindred, tongues, and people, declaring, We, through the grace of God, have seen the plates, and we declare with the words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven and brought and laid them before our eyes, that we beheld and saw the plates and the engravings are on, and we know that by the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that we beheld and by record of these things, and they are true. There was also the testimony of eight other witnesses who saw and handled the plates and saw the engravings thereon. While the Book of Mormon was in process of translation, Joseph Smith and his scribe Oliver Cowdery repaired again to the forest to pray. While they were thus praying, a messenger from heaven descended in a cloud of light, and having laid his hands upon them, he ordained them, saying, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of the Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron. Subsequently, they received also the Melchizedek priesthood. This was to be an authoritative ministry. Finally, the day to organize the church arrived, April 6, 1830. The young prophet and five young associates met at the home of Peter Hutmer in Fayette, New York, in obedience to the command from heaven, and proceeded to organize the church. They followed no pattern then existing on earth. This was not Reformation, this was Restoration. And thus, after the long apostasy, the church began to come forth out of the wilderness and was restored in its original organic form with apostles and prophets. It was restored with all the gifts and blessings the doctrines, ordinances, and sacraments of the old Jerusalem church. It comes to us bearing in its hands the three witnesses of the written word, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, the last named representing the still open canon of Scripture, unique and unlike anything else in the modern religious world. These three books agree in one. In the beginning of the Restoration, then, one voice was heard in prayer and then in testimony. But the voice behind the veil from time to time called others. And so they came one by one, saying, Here am I, Lord, send me. The voice is still calling, calling your name and mine, and others in many lands. Presently it will call the names of those not now born. God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are still at work in the world. We cannot judge the scope of the Restoration Movement by the numerical strength of the Church at any given time. The Kingdom of God cometh not with observation. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed planted in the ground. It is like a pebble that will drop in the water and the waves circle round with a shock. 
But in the beginning of the Restoration, God started in motion many powerful forces worldwide, perhaps unobserved by us, to bring to pass the things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. His work will go on, though thrones topple and nations are destroyed, until the world is ready for the coming of the Son of Man. This is our witness, as it is written, by these things we know there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting the same unchangeable God, Doctrine and Covenants 17 and 4. We rejoice in the prophetic testimony of Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon concerning Christ, and now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him that he lives. For we saw him, even on the right hand of God, and heard the voice by record that he is the only begotten of the Father. This is our witness and our testimony, that the restoration movement is of God, like our fathers and mothers before us, we have made covenant with him, and our covenant we shall keep. Oh.